The John Campia Show, in association with Designing Hollywood, presents... Welcome to the Designing Hollywood Podcast. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. The Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies, the movie industry, and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by Costumes Rental Corporation. Our guest today is one of the film industry's most sought after makeup artists. With an illustrious career and amazing talent in the field of movie makeup, he is the makeup department head and designer on recent films such as Blade Runner 2049, Sicario, Nightcrawlers, Prisoners, The Fighter, Eight Mile, and he's been the personal makeup artist for Mark Wahlberg, Daniel Craig, Jake Gyllenhaal, and many more. His skill and professionalism have kept him in constant demand for the last three decades. His world-building creative hand is visible everywhere. As a prosthetics designer and head of the makeup and hair department on Denis Villeneuve's recent adaptation of Frank Herbert's 1965 classic novel, Dune. And it was recently nominated in the category of Best Makeup and Hairstyling for the 2022 Oscars and Best Makeup and Hair for the 2022 British Academy Film Awards. His awards include a Primetime Emmy, a Saturn Award, two Hollywood Makeup Artists Guild Awards, and two Gemini Awards. He has two previous BAFTA nominations for Nocturnal Animals and Blade Runner 2049. He has earned multiple award nominations and wins, becoming one of the most respected talents in the film community. His most recent work is currently on display on Disney Plus in something I've wanted to see for the last 40 plus years, Moon Knight, where what he's done with Oscar Isaac, creating two characters or more, we don't yet know, Mark and Steven has been extraordinary. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome Donald Mowat to the Designing Hollywood Show. Thank you for such an introduction. I'm really, um, it's very nice of you. It's nice to see you and thanks for having me, having me back. And once again, you're working with Jake Gyllenhaal. Correct. Um, I think my eight or ninth film, he's a very persuasive man. He knows how to get me uh, to go to work when I'm ready for a vacation. I mean, now that we're on the John Campia YouTube channel and uh, in the mornings we do a daily entertainment show, we our, our audience skews towards sci-fi, fantasy, horror, action, adventure, fantasy. Uh, your, your, uh, your credits are, are a, a geek's wet dream. I mean, my God, you worked for John Carpenter on In the Mouth of Madness, which I think is, I mean, amazing. You even worked on Bill Deere's If Looks Could Kill. <laughs> if people remember that, I do. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> um, but I, it's just incredible. I, I, I look at the, the, the films that you've worked on. You worked on Guillermo del Toro's Mimic. Um, yeah. You worked on Three Kings for David O. Russell. You were the uh, Mark Wahlberg. You began a long and fruitful career with Mark Wahlberg. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think you worked on Planet of the Apes with Mark Wahlberg and The Perfect Storm yeah. with Mark, Mark Wahlberg and Rockstar. I guess yeah. to, to begin, you are a makeup artist and you work on people. You're not like Rick Baker who makes werewolves or uh, giant apes. I wonder mm-hmm. if you could kind of give us a little insight into what a makeup artist does. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm certainly no Rick Baker. I couldn't even be in the, you know, um, share the same sentence with him. What he does is, is it's a unique kind of brilliance that is in the world of, you know, what Kazu does. And, and, and it, it's a type of makeup design and makeup artistry uh, that is unique and unto itself. Of, yes. Of, well, it's, you know, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, but I think it's it's really important that it is all makeup, sort of like saying co- all costumes are costumes. Right. You know, a dress is a dress or a suit's a suit. But I think it's a it, it it's a kind of a finer art of a different, uh, the same genre, but a very different, highly specialized skill that's more often than not working with with prosthetics and appliances rather than working on uh, human skin and natural faces and hair and hair. If that makes, if that, if that oh, makes sense. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I've often yeah. said on this show that from a producing standpoint, some of the key hires that you make on any film, first and foremost, 
are the costume department and the makeup department. And I don't mean yeah. special effects makeup like Rick Baker. I mean, you both worked on Planet of the Apes with Mr. Wahlberg. Mm -hmm. But an actor, mm -hmm. an actor's makeup artist has to be one of the key hires on any movie because an actor has to know that when they walk out in front of the camera, they don't need to worry about how they look. They've got to concentrate on their character. And doing facial makeup especially um, is, is an incredible skill. And it's something that, ask any actress, <laughs> they'll tell you how important yeah. a makeup artist is. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you could give us a little insight. How did you get in to the profession? And um, what drew you to the art form? I, I think, um, well, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of um, you know, similar threads that people have in their stories that we all have, uh, you know, whether when we do something in a creative realm or, or how we aspire, I don't know, to write or direct or filmmaking is filmmaking. I, I don't care how, you know, I guess some people feel that only writing and directing and producing is filmmaking, but right. I think up in costume and is filmmaking and it's character building. So for me as a kid, I mean, like a lot of people who, who do, who do this, I was, a, I don't, I don't know if I was a geeky kid, I guess I was. And I love movies and, I loved all of that. I, you know, I was enthralled by it, but I think what really got me into it was the fact that I saw it was actually a job. There were mm. people's names, as you saw, and I was so fascinated, particularly with costumes and the way people looked. And, and moreover, and this is a funny thing to say to people now that I'm the age I am, was looking at all the makeup artists and they were all men. Now, I, I know it's a funny thing to say today, and everybody listening, ladies, gents, everybody, <laughs> uh, people who are gender neutral, I'm just saying, it's not that different. You have to understand, when I was a kid, it really, there was no place for me to go. Right. There was no guidance counselor at school that said, Donald Mo, what are we going to do with you? You're getting A's in drama and French and art history, but F's and D's in math and science. What do we do with you? You can't throw a ball. You can't play hockey. What the, f you know? Um, <laughs> so when I saw makeup by all these names, and they were almost exclusively men um, at that time, I thought that's a job. And so I, that drew me to it, actually, as a way I could sort of say to people, actually, I could do, because I was doing bits of makeup in theater and reading Richard Corson's book and the art of makeup and the t professional technique. Even my dad was like, what the hell are we going to do with this kid? <laughs> what do you do with me? I liked a bit of blood and I wasn't so much monster makeup, but I loved recreating. I, I did this thing with um, some play about, hol I don't know what, 14 year olds being in a Holocaust play, but made them up like they were really, you know, with, with you know, uh, as though they were they were in uh, uh, prisoners of war and a, a camp and making them look terrible and sickly. And I kind of loved it. And I was sort of good at it. And people <laughs> said, I could do it. So that's really my uh, sort of start in the business. You know, it's funny. I, I, I think the first name makeup artist's name that I ever heard was Ben Nye. You know, yeah. and and yeah. that was like you said. I, I thought it was curious. Um, I, any kid growing up thinks you see your mom doing makeup, and then I clearly, not only did Ben Nye do makeup, but he designed. He made makeup. He made it himself. You know, yeah, and, nice. and sure. yeah, and it was uh, it was incredible. Well, you know, I, I look back on your your um, uh, uh, inc just incredible your, your incredible list of credits, and I I wonder how. You know, it's one thing to want to do makeup. You know, lots of people want to do get into the film industry. How did you actually do it? What was the what was the path that you chose once you once you knew learning and, and working in plays and things? What led you into feature film work? I think, um, like everything else, you end up getting in a gang, so to speak, where you you know, kindred spirits, birds of a feather. You you mm. hook up with other kids and people who are interested in the same things and want to make movies and student films. And, and next thing you're being pulled over to, you know, come work on this and operettas and Gilbert and Sullivan and low budget horror films and trying to get into the unions and all that stuff. And, you know, you start to meet people, photographers and, and you, you remember all those people. And I hope 
I'd like to remember them and hope they remember me. People who gave each other breaks and said, you know, hey, you do the makeup for this photo shoot. I'll give you free pictures. I'll give you some portfolio right. shots. And, and that's how I remember how we did it. And we thanked everybody who helped us with our, you know, portfolios. And, and then the models would call up and, uh, you know, then little films would happen and they'd need a couple of makeup artists. And that's really how it started. And I think it still does exist that way in a very, uh, well, actually, no, it does exist that way. I think now the stakes seem higher for some reason, and it disturbs me a little bit. But when I was a kid, you really could be 15 or 16 and participate, whereas now you seem to have to be 25 to be able to do anything. Um, yeah, I mean, I had the same experience. I, you know, I was in film school, and when I got out of USC, you would just do anything. You know, you'd make music videos, you'd work on student films, you'd, yep. you'd do yep. anything. And, and then suddenly, like you said, you met your tribe. You know, you met like-minded people that you liked. I mean, one of the things that I, I learned quickly was people cared as much about your talent and ability as they did about how could they get along with you? Could they spend 12 hours a day on a set with you? Uh, yeah. And you had to be able to do both, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I worked with, um, I had a little job in a cafe where I grew up in, in Montreal um, with a young actress called Leslie Hope. And and that was really what brought me to L.A. the very first time when I was 19 or 20 years old. Leslie Hope was cast in John Cassavetti's film Love Streams. And she was a very good friend of mine. She was in many of my test photos hmm. where I did her makeup and I did it all. And we did these test photos. And then I came to L.A. and stayed with her. But she ended up being the star of her own TV series. And, and um, I'll think of the, the, the show in a minute. And she's still working in the industry as a director. Uh, but she was in Knott's Landing and she was in, you know, Oliver Stone's. Uh, uh, oh, God, I, I, I'm going to have a, a senior moment. But she was in talk radio on a number of films. And so we started all of these people that started together. Many people were starting to have these sort of careers and we all stayed in touch and, and helped each other. And, and that's kind of how it started. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's I think that a lot of people have stories about working with friends of theirs that sort of brought them in and mentored them or helped them out, which is I, I love hearing that. Um, you know, your 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 uh, this credit these credits of yours, you know, you went you did so many different kinds of movies, but what I find interesting is that when you're a makeup artist, it's almost like uh, magicians who do card tricks it's close-up magic you're i mean you're literally in an actor's face sometimes for quite some time and that has to be something that you must have learned was that easy for you you know when you're literally face to face cheek to cheek nose to nose and you're working on someone's face did that take a while to develop that skill it's such a great question i don't think i've been asked that ever before so um that's really interesting. Somebody once asked me, do I get nervous being in people's proximity? And I think what's so great about the question is that uh, I think it's the one area and, you know, everyone in film thinks their job is the most important. <laughs> job. And they are. I'm, they I all mean, are. You know. <laughs> but there is a certain level of truth, as you know, and, and I think uh, more so today, maybe because I, I think the industry has changed. But I do think it's interesting because we are the only department. I, I don't care what anyone says. You are actually in somebody else's space that right. no other department, nobody else faces. No. I mean, hair work from behind people, costume or not. I mean, even when you're in somebody's intimate sort of, you know, kind of helping figure out what underwear they're wearing, nobody is actually in your, your space at four or five o'clock in the morning when you are at your worst or best. <laughs> right. However, Maybe. And, and, and I think that we're not often credited uh, properly for that because that's a, it's a, it's a minefield for, for many people. But I, I think my nature, I think I was a good natured person. I don't know what happened, but I used to <laughs> was a, very, a very good natured child, according to my father. Um, so I think I, I was kind of enthusiastic and I love making films and I still do. And I think that that's maybe what came across actors um i love actors i don't know why i they don't always deserve it um <laughs> they really don't but i do love them and and they like me a lot and i think that we are kindred spirits 
And I probably, I, I think they feel I'm there for them and, and I have their backs and, and their confidence. And that's probably why I've stayed. Uh, but as far as working on someone's face, it's very interesting that you have to um, occasionally have to take a deep breath, um, you know, and, and it's rare, but every once in a while you have to go, God, you know, I, I can't believe I have to do this or, um, but I love the work and, and yeah, it's, it's, I don't really get nervous now, but when I see younger or newer people, I always tell them nervous is good. I think nervous is a very good trait. Um, shy is good to a point, mm. uh, but nervous being unsure, uncertain is not a bad thing. After 30 years, if you're terribly nervous, your handshake because you're doing a makeup, I think maybe we might want to reconsider. Um, but nervous is good. Nervous is creative. It's 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 special. I think we all have that fear. Everybody does. Well, you your career, you've worked with some of some of the biggest stars that are working today, including Mark Wahlberg and Daniel Craig and, and Jake Gyllenhaal and when you how do you know when you click with an actor obviously you do with those people because they've brought you back film after film after film and currently you've worked with Oscar Isaac on a, on a number of films how do you how do you develop that rapport with somebody well i mean oscar to be fair it was just the t it was dune and then uh, uh, moon knight daniel and i have a long history together and certainly jake and and mark um i i would have continued working with mark i mean there's it's we're still great friends and I really, I really deeply love him. And he's like a little brother or, or sort of family. I think just the films he was making were not films I, I, I was interested in. And that's mm. full transparency. And I think it's a fair thing to say. Mm -hmm. I, I love what I do, but if I'm going to be working 16, 17 hours a day, putting my, my health and, you know, at risk and, and losing out on family time and personal life, I don't really want to do it on those types of films. That's that's sure. I want to work on films I would like to see. And Daniel Craig and Jake Gyllenhaal happened to be making those films and at the time. So uh, Jake and I have become great friends. Daniel, um, you know, I worked with on a number of films and, and, you know, sometimes you also move on and people, you know, it just happens. It just, you know, uh, Daniel, I mean, you don't, I think you can work so far. We did the two bonds together. Extraordinary person to work with. But then, you know, his life changes well, as well. I should well. say you guys did Skyfall and Spectre together. Yeah, and and other films, you know, Cowboys and Aliens. And, and Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Where you, I, I love it when you work with actors whose faces you mess up. Like Daniel Craig got strangled. He gets beaten up. Yeah, yeah. You know, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, he's hanging from his neck. And like... Some of the work you did on on Jake and Southpaw, I mean, that was some great stuff. And 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 the work, I mean, he he looked not so good in uh, Nightcrawler because he was not yeah. supposed to look good. And the work yeah. you did, I mean, Jake Gyllenhaal seems fearless, like he really well, he's fearless. And you know, we don't get those opportunities anymore. I mean, Jake is now, you know, of course, everybody gets a bit older and Nightcrawler was unique. I mean, on Southpaw, I mean, I, I designed it, I prepped it. And then uh, Louis Zakarian was able to step in for me and, and and do the film because I was, I think, something overlapped. And um, but, yeah, I think Jake is is someone as a leading man also is a great character and stronger. Yeah. And, and Velvet Bus, so we were able to do some fun things and and. Uh, like you said, girl with the dragon tattoo. But I think um, ultimately working with a director as a department head is sort of what I was missing, maybe. Mm. Um, and being a personal, and it's not to discredit it, because I loved certainly working with, with those guys and some of the girls, is that I think creatively being the head of department, working with a director is where I really wanted to be working. Well, speaking of working with directors, I mean, Denis Villeneuve going from, uh, you've worked on Prisoners, you worked on Sicario, Blade Runner 2049, Dune. I guess, should I ask, are you going to be working on Dune 2? Packing the boxes. That's what all this big, huge mess behind me is. Everything's a bit upside down. Because, spoiler alert, Oscar Isaac's dead. <laughs> so, no, it's... it's I, now, how do, you, how do you develop, obviously, having... You know, a, a director doesn't want to have to worry about 
makeup. You know, he wants his he wants his people to come on and ready to go and prepped and all that. How yeah. did you develop? I mean, Denis Villeneuve is. Did you know him? For because he's isn't he French Canadian? Yeah, I never. Well, I didn't know. I knew who he was. I'd seen Incendie, which is a remarkable. Film. Such a great movie. Oh my god! I mean, I knew his films, Maelstrom, which I think was one of his first films, mm. which was incredible. Um, no, actually, it, it's um. I'm really name dropping, aren't I? I was you can. I you was can. recommended to Denis by um, the amazing really amazing good friends of mine uh roger deacons and his wife james deacons and can can we just take a moment yeah. take a moment and and that's not just a name drop i mean that guy and his wife working together one of the great cinematographers of all time yeah yeah and and i think that they because we'd worked together on skyfall um i don't it just sort of came up on prisoners i guess they were in atlanta and do you know that thing where it wasn't just them, but there was a number of producers, Ed McDonald, who I'd worked with years earlier on Three Kings, and there were actors on it. So I think people put the pieces together and went, wait a second, Melissa Leo, Terrence, I'd worked with a lot of them. And they were going to hire locally. And this is happening a lot, as you know, when you go on location. And it's very hard for us, especially department heads, when you go, wait a second, like, you know, I know... Everyone says a local can do it. And and I'm all for it. I get sure. it. Everyone has to have a break. But this was a very complex film with some tricky makeups. And and so that's when my name got brought up to Denis. And I had a phone call with him. And he hired me. And next thing I was prepping uh, the makeups for the film. And that's where I met Jake Gyllenhaal. And um, the rest is, you know, history, as they say. And it was sure. a remarkable experience. A great experience. Yeah, and then having that kind of a relationship, I mean, and it's, it's, let me ask you this, I mean, I ran into you on the Warner Brothers lot after seeing Dune for the first time in that unbelievable Steve Ross theater. Yeah, with, yeah. With the, the unbelievable sound system, and it was the way I'm sure Denis wanted it seen. For you, when you get to see a movie that you've worked on like Dune in that kind of a, an environment where, where it's shown the way it's supposed to be shown... How do you feel about it? How do you feel about seeing your work presented in the best possible way? And, and um, you know, obviously, I think Dune was a film for the ages. People probably will be watching it 100 years from now. And, and what's it like for you seeing something? You know, when you, people don't quite understand, when you're working on a movie, it's, it's very, I guess I would call it blue collar. <laughs> you know, it's, it's people work their asses off. And it's, ve it's a very different experience working on a movie from then sitting and watching the final, final film. Right. Well, of course, and I'm glad you've said that because blue collar it is. Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a side to it. You know the the contrast, the the juxtapositions of films, right? Of kind of premieres and awards and movie stars, and then the real you know working people of films, for which I am one of them. I mean, mm -hmm. there's the the you know a, a side to it which is very privileged and can be really annoying to tell you the truth for all of us. Uh, <laughs> And then there's another side to it, which is kind of pure and, and the world of people like Roger Deakins and, and James Deakins, who are incredible, extraordinary people and, and filmmakers and artists. And, and also let's all forget all of that really deeply good friends. Right. Uh, there's a whole separate thing we forget about, but yeah, people work very hard. I mean, craft service and, and, and not just the people who put the pictures up there on the screen and get the actors ready. I think the actors sometimes and, and managers and agents have to stop and realize that there are people who got up hours and hours and hours before and worked 10 times harder than almost anybody and received no recognition or the money or compensation. And, and for that, I'm thankful to make my living at it. But I know when I saw Dune first in Venice, which we're rarely invited to those events, as you know, we right. can barely ticket. I mean, my God, unless, you know, how do you get invited to Venice? I mean, um, so to see it at the Warner Brothers in that particular theater when I saw you and I ran into people I haven't seen in years and, and people who I admire. I mean, V. Neal was there and, uh, you know, peers and colleagues and incredible uh to see them watching the film, it, it's it's just uh, it takes your breath away. 
And I know it's a once in a lifetime thing. I've never had that maybe one or two films in my career in 35 years. I don't know how it just never happens. And many people, it never does happen. They just keep trying. Right. So I don't know what to say other than you have to be happy with every job you do and try to make the most of it. Yeah. I mean, you've worked on even like, I have to say another knockout movie was Damien Chazelle's first man where you did Ryan Gosling. He played Neil Armstrong and, uh, that was another film that I was really knocked out by as a lifelong real space fanatic. And I was actually moved by it. You know, the, uh, yeah. the the movie was beautiful. I thought Ryan Gosling, I mean, he played this sort of Neil Armstrong almost as an otherworldly presence who, who was going to do this thing and become the first human being to set foot on the moon. And I thought they did a really great job. I mean, he was great in the film and, the, the end of it was one of the most, I mean, I, I'll watch any movie that's set in space or deals with, especially that deals with the real space program, whether it's The Right Stuff or Apollo 13, First Man, and what a wonderful movie. Again, very overwhelming to see that on the big screen. I agree um, completely. Yeah, I had a really uh, cathartic experience, not, you know, working with Ryan, working with Clara Foy, who's one of my favorite people I've ever met in my life. I mean, mm. she just made me cry. There's a quality. I'm going to see her actually. I've stayed in touch with her. There's a quality to her and an earnestness and everything about that film took me to my early childhood. And that's not an experience I've ever really had because uh, it's, I haven't worked on films of that time period of the late sixties. And right. so I really had this moment uh, watching that on television as a kid with my, my siblings and my parents, um, you know, uh, it took, it really was profound. And Damien was an incredible uh, director and our whole crew, but Lena shooting it and Paul Lambert, you know, everything again about it was just, a, it was masterful filmmaking. I was very proud to be on a project. It was not an easy, it was not the easiest environment. It was a little right. depressing. And I think you take some of that home with you. And I, I, I would say that was a, one of the heavier films I've ever worked on. Wow. Well, it's, I mean, the geek in me wants to remind everybody that Claire, F Claire Foy also played Elizabeth Slander in The Girl in the Spider's Web, which was, <laughs> which, so, so you have a connection to, yeah, I would be remiss if, you know, you worked on The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and Claire yeah. Foy came back and played, played Elizabeth Slander. Yeah. Not that you did her, not that you did Elizabeth Slander's makeup, but you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, they're great. And then everybody in First Man was, I mean, I mean, all those people were incredible. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, you know, the <laughs> you've worked now for Marvel twice. And, yeah. and of course, our, our viewership is, I mean, I'm over the moon. Doctor Strange opens next week, and we get the final episode six of Moon Knight. And, you know, the first time, I don't know if you remember this, but the first time we spoke, you actually asked me, you said, um, do people know Moon Knight? You know, and I was—I told you, I said, "Dude, I'm a, I'm a mom," and I even showed you in, with in arm's oh, length. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, and I told Oscar. <laughs> I told him the next day. I had a, I had a Moon Knight bust, and I was showing you the comics, and uh -huh. uh, I, I said, "No, Moon, Moon Knight is definitely." Uh, I think of all the Marvel comic characters, he's a cult character, you know, because he's never had his definitive run. He's had so many different incarnations over the years, and what Marvel has done with that character. Um, is is quite extreme, and it, it it it's not the way I it's not what I would have expected. But what I've well bef before I get to Moon Knight though, I've got to ask you. Obviously, you did Jake Gyllenhaal's makeup uh, as Mysterio in Spider Man Far From Home, and I'm just curious. Like, once you go to work on a Marvel project, there's all kinds of secrecy, and of course, yeah, yeah. you know they have to keep. They have to keep their, they've always got great costumes, but they have to keep their villains. Like people, no one has seen Christian Bale, who's playing Gore the God Butcher in Thor Love and Thunder. No one's seen him. They've, they, they, in the first trailer, he has, no, one, no one's going to see what he looks like until they decide to reveal it. So when you came on to work on Spider-Man Far From Home, was it what was it like to work on a Marvel movie? I mean, obviously, your department you're you're no nonsense 
you know, this this whole thing yeah. signing NDAs and was it was it was it a wacky experience working on a Marvel film? Yeah, yeah I remember. I mean, look, I, you know, uh, some of it I find a little bit. You know, I mean, <laughs> they wouldn't. They you know, you don't get a. It's, everything is redacted, right? right. Get redacted. <laughs> and then to get your sides, you know, the sides you can see what you're actually shooting. Like, do I have to? Is he sweaty? Is he dirty? Is he dirty? right? Well, I then, mean, you have to know. So for people that at home that they don't know, a lot of the time with normal movies, you do what's called a page turn, where all the department heads are oh, yeah. sitting around a table, and and you actually go through the script with everybody and you can ask questions of the directors, the producers, right. whomever. So everybody's on the same page. Do they do page turns on Marvel movies? I did get a script, but it was redacted. It had <laughs> lots of lines drawn through it. I just thought, really? Okay. And and <laughs> luckily, I mean, I went in just as a personal to do Jake's. So I would call Peter King and said, is there anything I need to know? Like, I mean, I got a couple, you know, there's a double, do we need to double him? Jake's got this beard. Um, I took it very seriously when I turned up in London, like I'm, you know, on, on the kinds of movies I've been working on, but I, then you wear, they give you a big, uh, thing like kids would wear, like traveling alone, minor traveling by themselves <laughs> or you know, handle with care, like Paddington bear, this little plastic thing I had to wear around that had my sides in it. And it was, they were in red so that everybody knew Donald Mullet's got sides. You have to get them back at the end of the day. <laughs> so there was a lot of that kind of thing going on. Um, yeah, that's a little bit exo It's exhausting. It's just exhausting. When we went to the costume fitting, which was Anna Shepard is just incredible. She was designing. I love that. What I loved about Marvel, this really is the truth of it. Jake and I, I'd never worked on, on one. And Jake, I went with him to this costume fitting. And I thought, Anna Shepard is, you know, she did the pianist. She's an incredible costume designer. You've got somebody who comes from that sort of background. So I felt this sort of, this thing of people who worked on these really phenomenal, highly dramatic films are now doing a Marvel movie where, you know, Jake is going to basically be, you know, have big hair and a beard and look incredible. And I just said to Jake, I think we have to embrace this. You know, this is, <laughs> this is, because he wasn't sure. He'd never been in anything like this, but I was sure. And and I kind of loved it, and I think that that's why I like these these projects. Um, uh, oh, and that cost that Mysterio costume was badass. I it mean, he was looked great. He looked great, and I think when you see it, and you you sort of put all the pieces together, and that crew were sensational, and the director, and and you know all, all of the people we were shooting in Leaves, and I think it was it was kind of great. It really was. And Tom Holland is just unbelievable, you know, just unbelievable. Everybody on it. So it was a great experience. But the secrecy and and the you know that was a little a little bit much for me because in the end you you've got to do your job. Right now, but then you jumped in again. You know, you you and well, Oscar. Yeah, I, that's well. I can be persuaded. Oscar during the reshoots, well, additional photography of Dune. Uh, you know, Oscar had never doesn't really have film makeup and hair people with him, hmm. and and he, you know we knew for for Moon Knight this needed some character work, and and so he'd ask me about it, and um, I thought, yeah, I'm into it, not but you know then the production said, well, will you come on board and sort of run the hair makeup and prosthetic -y stuff, and I thought, okay, I'm in, and and. Um, I liked it. I liked the script very much. We did actually get to read the scripts. And um, and I hadn't been part of, uh, I know it's streaming and everything, but honestly, I haven't worked in television or what they now call streaming, but to me was still a very different genre in many, many years. And it was, it was really good for me to do. Well, I, I have to say, I mean, first of all, one of the extraordinary things, I think anybody who watches Moon Knight Respond, response to is Oscar Isaac's performance. And a lot of it is dominated by the two characters, the the Mark Spector character and the Stephen Grant character. And I'm curious about that. Like, he his performance, he's able to change sometimes mm -hmm. in the same shot. And I'm wondering, for, for makeup, was there anything that you did maybe subtly to delineate the personalities that he took on? Yeah. 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 Well... 
quite often so we try to not do too much switching over within the same day a lot of people had a really difficult time following i mean even people on the production and it's not a i'm not you know it's not a disparaging remark i think the psychological element of it many people think that you know you it's very hard to explain it is still the same person right right and i think that was very hard to get across because when you look at a call sheet and it says steve and mark steve and mark right. mark steve. so i had little ways of trying to get everyone to understand that no no he's mark but he looks like steven or he's steven looking like mark mm. um, so yeah there were i mean if you think about uh, i'm just thinking now Stephen, I thought of as being very kind of uh, tired, exhausted, kind of jet lagged, uh, sweaty appearance, which he kind of did. Right. And um, tired. Um, and Mark looked a bit more together, more. Um, he had a little bit of makeup. You know, he looked tanned. He looked good. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you have to be very careful in makeup when you're working on a character that is the same person, because. You can't be, it's Jekyll and Hyde, which is really how I thought of it. Sure. I thought of it as Jekyll and Hyde, as Robert Louis Stevenson. But also I pointed out to Oscar very early, early on, I thought of things like Roman Polanski and The Tenant. Oh, and, for those of, he for those of, man, he liked it, that. for those people who, who, who haven't seen it, Roman Polanski's The Tenant that he actually stars in is one of the more disturbing movies I've ever seen. But for anyone who likes thrillers or, it's it's quite extraordinary. That's it a really, great that's a great film to cite for for Mark and Stephen. And, and that was it for me. And I stuck by it. And I know most people thought, "What is this guy talking about?" I think the only person who knew what I was talking about was Oscar Isaac because he's a very learned man and very well trained, and he knew exactly what I meant. And I pulled pictures together and I drew a little bit, to be fair, of Spider from David Cronenberg. Sure, uh, great fun. Another great I, Canadian, as, as you are. Well, uh, I don't know about that, but thank you. I did pull, you know, lots of things that because subtle psychological things are really tricky in makeup because everyone thinks it's sort of ta-da, it's this and then it's that. The fun I had were things, you know, I think there's an episode called Asylum where I've given him these sort of uh, dilated pupil contact lenses. Yeah, that that's uh, the last episode that that's aired. That was episode five. Okay. So he's got dilated pupils and I put stuff in his cheeks to swell them up. And, he, you know, that for me was a lot of fun because they have to be subtle that the car it's not a completely different person. But I think it was had a lot of makeup elements. We did little things again with May and with with Ethan. Um, but I did enjoy it. And I think working with Oscar because he's very, very committed and very good in this part. I thought actually he was extraordinary in in the part because in one day he would have both Stephen and Mark within the day and have to know the parts and plus the visual effect elements and my having to prepare doubles, photo doubles, stunt doubles. And then of course his brother is part is also part of it as the acting ensemble working opposite him as a, I don't want to say as an acting double and a kind of a photo double, but, uh, performance double to to work opposite him and and so I was you know wait wait his a, I didn't know that his actual brother yeah so um, that I think um, you know you have to have somebody to work with so we had photo doubles but also his brother was in it as his wow. playing opposite him to feed him lines yeah wow oh so, for like the yeah. so Mark and Stephen wow that's that's fascinating really cool and it's very good because I, it made complete sense as far as a you know i i remember having meetings with with the powers that be saying you know look we did you know we did prosthetics um i had wigs built to put different doubles in who were fairly good photo doubles sure but it, you need an acting double. And I saw this when I was referencing things like Spider and another Cronenberg film, which was, um, oh my God. Dead Jeremy. Ringers. Dead Ringers, thank you. So as I was referencing that, technically working with visual effects with Sean Thaden, mm -hmm. myself, costume, everybody. Um, and I think it was very good. So I think Michael Hernandez, his brother, I mean, that is sort of already been spoken about out there. Sure. So I'm not giving away too much, um, but this will air after the show's finished, right? Yeah, well, uh, the, yeah, the show finishes in just a couple of days. Yeah. So I think that that was a very interesting aspect of it, to have 
somebody because often as you know they'll use someone who's got no real sense of it so for me you know i put uh him in a wig so the back of his head so you can see where sometimes he well you can't see it it's right. seen sean what great what our dps did was seamless i mean i think between costume and i got to give my team uh you know a lot of credit in the makeup and hair because we did a lot of work to make those doubles perfect and the wigs were perfect so that you just caught the back of the head of a double so that once the, this the magic of visual effects happened it really was seamless oh and dude it was i was looking for it too you know i'm always looking whenever i whenever like from star trek the next generation when brent spiner would play his evil lore counterpart his brother or you know jeremy irons and dead ringers was one of the most masterful yeah. of, of all that ever yeah. done but yeah. what you guys pulled off in moon knight it was seamless i mean it really really worked that's four or five departments working very closely together and i think that um it, it really was it was it was great because you don't know if it'll work we put a nose i mean you know you try things so you pick up the sense of it or at least the the you know and then getting into the young oscars and looking at kids and and matching people up i mean that takes a lot of work on our part and trying to match people and 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 the father and the mother and stuff so it's a lot of nuance i i would say there's a lot of makeup that's sort of not noticed in this but we we did quite a bit of work with with doubles and stunt doubles right i'm a huge fan of of oscar isaac i mean i loved him in uh, a most violent year which is a film i saw and was just knocked out by and of course the coen brothers inside yeah. lewin davis yeah was he Getting to know him and working with him on Dune is uh, obviously he, he played the Duke, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Duke of the Atreides clan. Um, was he, did he have any, I've seen interviews with him where he has, there's a toy company called Hot Toys that makes very expensive action figures of these characters and he had them in the background. But did he have any trepidation? I mean, at all, like like Mark and Steven? I mean, it was a, it was a tall order what they were asking him to do. Yeah. Was he worried about it at all? I didn't get that impression. I mean, I think you know, he might tell you differently. I felt the one thing that I said, you know, I don't know him terribly well. I worked with him once, you know, one film. It takes a long time to get to know somebody. Sure. But what I would say to him was that I thought he did a remarkable job because sometimes, let, well, we know that less is more, but it is so much harder to do what he, what he was doing was way more difficult than people know. Right, and sure. I think add the technical aspect to then have doubles and stunt doubles and work out all of that. Um, I think it was really masterful in terms of acting. And then, you know, a lot of newer people on, on a job. And then it was a stroke of genius, really, to have his brother as his sort of um, as a kind of an acting uh, double mm. feed him lines so that if he was doing Mark his brother was doing Steven and vice versa and then integrating really great photo doubles and some great stunt doubles I thought was was technically Sean Faden visual effects I, I mean uh, Greg Middleton I mean uh, with our two DPs I thought it was really uh technically kind of remarkable playing with the mirrors and the light uh very very impressive yeah it, it and it my God, does it come off on screen? I mean, the the Marvel TV properties—they're all given a list. I mean, they look like movies. They're absolutely, and and you know, to be able to shoot something and have uh, a, a crew, I was able to have a really good, you know, to pick a crew because I knew I needed to have people. And in COVID, and you know, I know that's boring now to talk about, but no, you know, not at all. But to be fair, you know, it is harder when you're having doubles, and like now we're getting people ready as. Mark, we've got to have doubles. You've got long shots. You've got close-ups. You've right. got, you know, so we had three and four doubles working. Then, you know, I've got the girl, May, and doubles for her. And then you've got avatars and you've got different people and and COVID and protocols. And it, it's it was a little overwhelming for, for something that really stars a guy and a girl and another guy, kind of. Now, did they use the... The, uh, the 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 stagecraft technology, the volume technology, where they're using the LED screens, 
uh, in the to create um, like instead of having to go on location, you can now use those LED screens that they're using. Disney's used them a lot in like the Mandalorian and Marvel shows. I know about the Mandalorian. We went out. We went to Jordan. We shot on location. Right. Okay. You were now. Yeah, we, was that like going? Was that a homecoming for you, having worked on Dune? Uh, it really was because I knew what I felt like. I know what we're doing. I'm good. Um, <laughs> I wish that I was a little bit full of myself. It was hard. I mean, it was not the easiest job, I have to say. I mean, we went to Jordan. It was hot. Um, you know, it was, uh, we had, I think we were there for a week. Um, yeah, but I felt very sure of myself because I'd been there before. I stayed in the same hotel. Wow, okay. Um, so yeah, you knew so the ropes. Was, you could help the rest of the crew. Where do you go get food? Where do you go get a drink? I wasn't scared. I mean, it was just... Um, yeah, I think also when you, you know, you get to a point, you start to feel very assured of, you know, maybe, maybe it is arrogance, maybe it's cockiness, I don't know. But I felt coming from, from the years I've had of experience onto a job like that, I felt like one of the old, old timers. And <laughs> it's the first time I really thought, God, I think I'm one of the old timers. And I started to say that to people. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of newer people on this right. job. Sure. Um, and sometimes, you know, I think that I, I, I'm probably, um, well, I'll get in trouble for it. But I do think that that's when I realized I thought I also thought maybe that's the point where you think maybe my level of experience is really sought after. But it's also could be very annoying to a lot of new people where they go, what is with that guy? <laughs> and I, I was very crabby with some costume makeup and hair people that thought, who does, you know, but I realize I think it's part of the passage of, you know, the rites of passage. Uh, um, so it, it made me laugh. There were days it, it, I found it quite funny um, to be on a set where I think there was maybe nobody who had more experience than me. <laughs> well, I, you know, I found I found there is a def, definitely an attitude change when I my first job, I worked on a low budget horror movie. And my attitude was I was the art department P.A. And I thought, okay, I'm going to get coffee for people for the next three years. I mean, this was my thing. I was going to shut up and do whatever menial jobs that anybody would throw my way. And I, I quickly realized that, you know, everybody wanted. I was I was working for props. I was I was building flats, and I was. It was yeah. the most fun I ever had. And I think that nowadays, I don't know if that attitude is still there. Like like, I knew I knew nothing. You know, and I, I wanted to learn. And but I think that doesn't happen today. I I, I wish I, I'm so glad you said it because I would I, I'll get in trouble saying it to other people. But that maybe was, I think, the turning point for me in, in the business the last couple of years. I've where, heard that a lot, actually. But yeah. Going, but just, yeah, yeah but I like because I don't I don't want to be that guy. I work with a lot of young people, as you know, and I love it. I love mentoring young, I mean, really young people, because I think we have to train people better. And, yes. and in a way, in a way that people will say, who trained you? How did you learn this? Because I love when people say, um, for instance, I'm going to tell you, I learned on the fly from Stefan Dupuy and Margaret Becerra how to use spirit gum to glue on what I was doing on Jeff Goldblum. How did I learn how to read the call sheet, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think now, um, and I'm not speaking just to this project, but to many projects of late, that a lot of people really can't be told. There, there's sort of, there's a kind of an attitude difference like you're talking about. Nobody wants to get anyone a cup of coffee anymore because suddenly that's demeaning. And, and I find it really demoralizing because I'll still get someone a cup of coffee. I, I, there was a, a loss of, I don't know, um, I guess it's lack of training. And I think that's what happens. And I hear it from a lot of friends. And, and what you're saying, the business has changed tremendously. Um, but the training on set's very different. And you have to be very careful that people's feelings aren't hurt. And you don't step on people's toes. And I think there's a big difference of, of bullying versus good training and... Um, I felt that uh, in the last couple of years on, on a number of jobs. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I've heard it from a lot of the people that I've talked to for this show. I've been doing it now for well, the better part of a year. The same kind of thing, interviewing for Designing Hollywood. There's there's a lot of people that that 
have have said that. And I think I see that the attitudes have changed. I mean, this idea that, you know, it takes time to learn something and Mm -hmm. being on a set and set protocol and even learning where to stand. You know, there's people that don't understand, don't stand in an actor's eye line. You know, that these are things that you need to learn, that that you have to have that that skill. And and it's, to me, I never thought, like, if if I were, were if I got chewed out for something, or if I and I didn't usually get chewed out, but if if somebody got a little testy with me, I never took it personally. It's it's like you know f- making movies is the one job in the world where you can calculate actually calculate how much every second costs mm-hmm. on in a twelve hour day. You you know exactly what your what yeah. your what your budget is for that day. And you can calculate it down to the second, and and it's not cheap. Every time the second hand clicks, you're talking hundreds of dollars. I feel like um, I'm so glad you're saying it because I think people who are listening, and there are, I mean, I just spoke to a group of kids in Granada Hills, you know, grade 10 and 11, and there were great kids who were really young filmmakers. I did find, uh, I've been on a couple of films recently where I've said, like, we need to go back and talk about continuity and what or how it really works and that people take pictures, but they don't really understand what pictures, why they're taking the pictures. And now that we're digital, do we really need to keep taking pictures? Does I don't know. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Oh. And everyone looks at me and I kind of go, but I'm not make. I mean, have I become like this crazy guy? Why are we taking, why is everybody standing in front of monitors taking pictures of the makeup and the costumes and the props and the hair and blah, blah, blah. It's all digital. I mean, it's not like when we started where it was 35 millimeter and you took pictures because you had dirt or blood over the face or the hair moved. People are just doing it because it, I don't, I don't know. And frankly, they don't know why they're doing it, but the the irony is people still can't match things. And that's what throws me. And well, when you say that, I mean, I just want to be clear, you know, like you, you, if somebody gets like in Southpaw, if somebody's a boxer or somebody gets hit in the face and if yeah. they're supposed to have the same blood for a 12 hour shoot day or or four shoot days that have the same blood or cut mm-hmm. on your lip from shot to shot, you have to make sure that it matches absolutely. Because if you have a wound that is sliding across yeah. someone's lip from shot to shot or scene to scene. It ruins the verisimilitude. It ruins the reality that's that everyone is trying so desperately to create. That's the whole thing about movies is you're, you well, want people yeah, to believe. Except, except in digital, it's almost impossible because, as you know, you're not cutting, you're not reloading, and you do continuous takes. So you're really at the mercy of the movie gods. And I think that's what you try to instill now is, is don't worry because there's some things – beyond your control sweats harder to match unless the directors you know what i mean yeah there are jobs where they'll let you go in but there are other jobs they're not and and so that poses other issues you have to come up with makeup and hair designs that are really simple or you have to find a way like are we going to carry this over and that's how i work i mean i'll be able to go to a director and these got i mean we were very lucky in muhammad and 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 benson and moorhead that you know um, look, I think we do this because then it can clean up. You have to really understand continuity and how to present it. Um, but I've been on other films where people don't. I have to say Guy Ritchie was a joy because he really is a great filmmaker. And you can also say, look, if you're not going to spend time doing it and matching it, don't do it. Um, mm. But it's very hard in digital for certain makeup aspects to match um, unless somebody's going to call cut or they're going to let you go in during a take, which is almost never going to happen. Right, right, right. It's interesting. You mentioned Benson and Moorhead. I, I'm huge fans of those guys. And they've made some incredible, their their movie Resolution, which I saw knocked me out, this low-budget movie with two dudes in a cabin. And then they made Spring, and they made The Endless, which I didn't even know when I was watching it, was a sequel to Resolution, and then they made Synchronic, and they've got a new film out that I haven't seen, but it's so great to see them coming and being tapped. Again, Kevin Feige and the team at Marvel tapping them to work on Marvel shows, and and they worked on uh, Archive 81 or whatever that show was called, too, and it's it's great to see them um, um, working on like movies. You know, they were... 
you know, I have to say they were very nice when I met them and, and prepped with them a little bit. Again, you know, it was newer for me because I, I wasn't used to the world of episodic for a very, very long time. And, and it took me a minute to, you know, shooting, you know, two episodes at one time. It's kind of block shooting on a movie, isn't it? And, right. Uh, so it was newer for me, but I think they really trusted me and, and uh, Muhammad as well. And, and you know, also working um, with people who are, um, I hate that expression, up and coming, but that's exciting for me. Yeah. I find that exciting. And I had a, a very young crew and I, I brought a lot of new, very young people to my crew. And I found that extremely exciting um, because they're going to learn, I hope, a, a good way to work and a, um, a way to be uh, very proficient and, and but also time efficient, because that is something that bothers me as well, you know, of kind of waiting, you know, when you're waiting a lot on makeup and hair, it gets a little bit embarrassing sometimes, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, it is part of the business. And, and my old friend who's a set decorator years ago used to say, Donald, it's show business, not show fun. And that's kind of what I feel. Sometimes the pressure on a job, whether it's Moon Knight or Dune or any of them is how long, how, how long? It's a fair question. Yes, it is. It's a fair question. And people have to also assume that responsibility. And, and that includes everybody in, in my world and, and, uh, to say, well, how long are we going to be doing this? And and so we did some makeups that were rushed, and and I felt that we still were able to do it. And you know, uh, but it is part of the job, and it's the side to it that I kind of liked on this because a lot of my team were able to learn great management skills uh, with doubles and getting a lot of people ready, like all the avatars in a given period sure. of time. Well, Donald, that brings up, I mean, as we as we come to the, the end of this interview, and by the way, again, it's been so great to talk with you. You know, you talked oh, a lot about, you. about young people. Um, what, what, where, where can you direct people if people said, how do I get started? You know, what mm -hmm. should I do in this business? How, Donald, can I, can I begin my journey to become a makeup artist in, in motion pictures and television? Well, I think that there's a lot. I, I would say um, there's a lot of areas in the industry, not just makeup, um, a lot of areas, hairdressing, props, costume. Um, I think you've had Megan on already, right, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's a lot of areas you need to get people motivated because I notice that a lot of people don't know. There, it's it, A lot of us are getting older and eventually retiring. Um, makeup is, you know, uh, it's, of course, everyone says it's competitive and there's a lot of people doing it, but I think that you have to be above all passionate. And I do meet people who don't love movies. They like them. You love movies. I know you do. You can tell you do. I love movies. I love, I love movies. I know you do. And if you <laughs> love movies, then you should be doing something related to films. Every once in a while, I will say to somebody, but you don't really love it. I mean, if you want to be a doctor or a nurse, you kind of love doing things for people. Yeah. You kind of love the teaching. And I do think that's something that's missing a little bit, is you want to love. I mean, it's one thing because you love doing makeup or you love doing hair, but you can love doing hair and work in a salon or work in photo shoots. It's not exclusive to the film industry. Sure. You can love doing fashion, but it doesn't mean you should be doing costumes. Um, if you want to tell stories with makeup and hair and costume and art direction and set decoration and vision, then pursue it. I mean, there are books, there's courses, there's colleges now. It's kind of all out there. And then once you find someone who knows something, you've got to just be polite and professional and ask them, may I call you? May I email you? A little may I and a Mr. or a Miss is usually really good. Yeah. And so, may I call you one day? I get a lot of resumes from people out of the blue. Hi, Donald. I'm like, no, actually, it might help if you said, hi, Mr. Mowat, because when I started, you didn't call people. You met, you wrote a letter. Right. And start asking for information. 
what could I do? Where could I, the Academy have young people programs, the TV Academy. Um, I know some high schools are starting programs, colleges, community colleges. Uh, we're doing mentorship for all kinds of areas, not just makeup. Uh, there's a real shortage. So I think really pursue it, the Facebook groups, the Instagram groups, uh, go onto the union websites, be knowledgeable. If you're passionate, you also have to research it. Do you think, you know, nowadays with social media, everyone's looking for fame on Instagram or whatever. You know, when you work in film, it's an it's it's a lifelong calling. You know, it's an avocation. You can't you you have to really love it, I think, because it's so hard. It's, it's it's so hard and you're right. You you have to love it, but this thing of I know it's changing a life, what do they call that? Life work balance. Right. I never knew what that was. <laughs> right. Our our, our film is our lives. <laughs> that's, that's... It, it, it was and it, you know, and I know this I, I've had a very interesting thing happen to me recently where <laughs> people have started this started, I guess, on Moon Night because I did have a real sort of you know, it was a very difficult time actually for me on another level personally. And I remember thinking maybe this is what everyone's talking about and um, uh, talking to my crew, you know, Megan and, and, uh, I, and nice people and Theo and all these sort of new, and I call them kids cause they're, they're young and sure. And, but I thinking maybe that's what they mean. Their life balance, they're happy. They have real lives, but they do expect a bit of time off and they do want long weekends. And I, I won't be, I make fun of them sometimes and I know I can be evil because I'll, I'll joke around and say, <laughs> when I was doing it, we never even had, we had Christmas day and New Year's day off. And I, I, but I did let them all have time off. So anybody listening, they all got lots of extra time. I let everybody go home for three or four days. I'm not a total Grinch, but having said that, <laughs> um, I am a little bit perplexed when I call people to say, hey, do you want to work? And they ask me things like, well, you know, uh, what's the schedule like in July? Because I, I want to go on family vacation. That's not part of my. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> and it, but also that's generational. Right. And, and I think so. I think it was very hard that I worked even on Moon Knight when days when Oscar wasn't in. I still had May to do or I had to design or prep stuff for Ethan, like a wig for him or a mustache. Sure. Uh, May or second unit. So I never had the time off and I was going through a rough time, uh, you know, with family and, and my father. And, you know, it was very difficult for me to figure the light because if I left, things fall apart. Yeah. And so I was eager to train people up so that I could leave. Mm. And that never really happened. So I think, uh, I guess my point would be we are all replaceable. That's for sure. But the life balance thing, I'm still working out. I'm not quite sure because even when I take a couple of days off and I did leave, it was very difficult for me. It was very stressful. And and I'm not sure if you can have it both ways. That's a personal thing for me. Yeah. If you no. can leave for a week or which many departments can. I think certain departments can do it. But makeup on the actor, makeup hair on the lead actors it's very difficult to hand that over yeah I, I, I totally understand that i mean that's 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 what you do you know and and you know yeah. it's funny because it a lot of people uh, look to me movies were the great the great art form of the 20th century and and as far as I, my whole life has been the study of storytelling and i think movies are the greatest form of storytelling humanity has ever come up with <laughs> Maybe the 21st century will eventually be some kind of interactive virtual reality or something. But I still think movies will endure. And um, to make great movies, it's almost like alchemy. It's like Rumpelstiltskin turning straw into gold. And it requires, yeah. Yeah. It requires a discipline and it requires a focus um, that I find marvelous. You know, I've been working in film and myself for 33 years and it 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 never gets old. I mean, especially being on a being on a on a people laugh, but being on a on a high budget, a large a big budget movie set is one of the great joys because nobody's on that set if they're not the best at what they do. And for the most part, with money yeah. Yeah. with every second counting, 
to be on a on a big budget movie and watching all of those pieces and all of those talented people um, working together in 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 concert to to create something to create every moment you know every shot a thousand things could go wrong but every all of those disciplines have to come together to create that verisimilitude in every single shot whether it's hair and makeup whether it's costume whether it's production design whether it's cinematography acting direction all of yeah. those things have to work together in tandem yeah. for every yeah. single shot of the film and sometimes mm -hmm. movies shoot for 100 days or 150 days and it's yeah. it's it's an amazing feat and then in post production with the editorial staff and the sound designers i mean my god dune dune there's a movie that the visual effects and the sound design and Hans Zimmer's now Academy Award winning score where mm -hmm. if you see the instruments he came up with and people, yeah. I think yeah. people made instruments that didn't even exist <laughs> to I record mean, the well, score. That's probably the only film I know of where you actually could just listen to the film. Oh my God. I mean, it's got a, a separate, that whole thing. No, I, I, I agree with you. And I think that was, um, to work i mean they've become i mean the sound department from dune have become really great friends of mine i mean i think that um you know theo green and I just all of them and yeah i i agree with you i think the real oscar to me the real award is being able to work at a job i love to do 100 uh, percent. after all these years now having said that it's getting harder to maintain Right. And now, you mean for percent. you or do you, in terms well, of the industry in general? Yeah. I think for a lot of people, for me, I would say Moon Knight was very difficult uh, for a lot of reasons uh, because there's a lot of technology you're keeping up with. There is the whole Marvel, which they were actually was really good. I, I enjoyed working with visual effects very much. It was the, you know, the strongest crossover on a Marvel, actually. Normally it would be makeup and costume, but I felt. On this, it's more makeup and visual effects. Right. Yep. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. And and um, yeah, but I would say um, it's it's the duration. It's having a crew. It's being away. It's the pandemic. It's getting, you know, the life work balance because it is harder to crew. I found it more difficult. Um, and so I do think that we're starting to see the business change. And I think that we the fact that we didn't have the strike the um well it was i think a mistake um in many ways because we needed the big reset do you mm -hmm. know what i mean yeah a reset had to happen and it didn't happen and and that's worrying me a little bit as we move forward that the reset did not happen that people are still very tired and getting back to very long hours again that's concerning me a little bit um, yeah yep you know, so I, I want to say what I think no one else will say because I don't know how much longer people can maintain. Mm. Uh, but a lot of films have gone back to very long days again. And um, that's Moon Knight. We didn't. Thank goodness. We stuck to our days. And you couldn't have done it. I mean, it was all Oscar. I mean, you know, he worked every single day. He had a week off, I think. Through the whole project, he had actually a week. No, more than that. He had a week and then the odd day off. Ethan worked. I don't know, maybe a day a week, two days sure. a week. Sure. At most. And May worked quite a bit. And she was a delight. She really was. Um, but for Oscar to be every day on a six month job, you just can't sustain and you can't do what he was no. doing and you can't do what we're doing. No, um, it was incredible. And what you guys was yeah. what you guys did was incredible. Moon Knight was an incredible feat. Well, Donald, if do you have a social media presence? Can people find you on social media? Sure, they can find, I'm trying to get better at it. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. Um, I think it's what at Moet Donald or at Donald Moet. I think so. Yeah, I do it all. I, I love it because I think it opens it up, and I do a lot with the students on there. So, whether it's with you know here in LA or when I'm overseas, so people can find me that way. Well, listen, I have to say, uh, this interview has been again fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Donald Moet. Thank you. Uh, you, uh, a singular talent. It's been such a great honor to speak with you this evening. Uh, uh, I hope I run into you again soon. What, I mean, we talked about The Interpreter is your, your next project with Guy Ritchie. Is there anything you can talk about after that? Or is that what you're working on now? 
I mean, you uh, did allude to you maybe going back to Jordan. Well, maybe. we're, we're full, yeah, I'm really very much in pre-production and uh, getting that ready and meeting people and getting ready to go very soon. Because, boy, I can't wait for Dune 2, and I really hope that they do Dune Messiah and fill out the Paul Atreides Dune trilogy. Because I think if people haven't read the book, Paul Atreides, uh, his uh, life doesn't end well. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm there for it. <laughs> I want to see that. I love it. Well, look, thanks for it. This is great. Thank you so much. I'm glad you love Moon Knight. I'm really proud of it, and I think everybody did incredible work. I mean... It's, you know, one of those things when you think of... Apparently my dog loves Moon Knight, too. <laughs> the dog does, too. He wants to go for a walk. Uh, I'm glad you like it and and, um, and that people are really like it. It's Thanks fantastic. So well, Donald Moet, thank you for speaking with us and Bye. thank you for being on the Designing Hollywood podcast. And thank you to our very impressive sponsor, Costumes Rental Corporation. The variety of costumes at Costumes Rental Corporation is expansive. CRC is recognized worldwide as the premier supplier of military and police costume uniform rentals. Costume Rentals Corporation takes pride in its commitment to each customer, helping to produce the type of exceptional look needed for a successful production. And thank you to our guest, Donald Moat, for coming on the show. My God, I love speaking to him. A special thanks to our producer and founder, Martika Ibarra, and of course, our co-founder, legendary costume designer, Marilyn Vance, and our new partner, John Campia of the John Campia YouTube channel. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification button, and you can find the Designing Hollywood podcast wherever you get your podcasts, also on iTunes. Follow me, Robert Meyer Burnett, on Instagram, on Twitter at BurnettRM, or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. Thanks for watching. We very much appreciate it.